Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to the Watchman Newscast live stream on this Wednesday, April 10th. I am fresh from the U.S.-Mexico border, spent three days in Eagle Pass, Del Rio, some of the very hot spots on America's very porous southern border. And we got the inside story there from first responders, law enforcement on the ground about the, I mean, you could process. say border crisis, certainly number one. Number two, tragedy, both sides of the border, people dying. And number three, a national disgrace, I would say. And I don't mince words here that this has even been permitted. And yes, the key word is permitted to happen by our so-called leaders in Washington, D.C., in the White House right now. But that will come next week on Stackelbeck Tonight, a special three-part series from the U.S.-Mexico border. We definitely want you to tune in for that. In the meantime, we're talking about another hot border, the Israel-Gaza border, a place where I've spent a lot of time, as you know, and we've been discussing it, obviously, for months now, six months. We just passed the six-month anniversary of the October 7th massacre carried out by Hamas jihadis, massacring some 1,200 Israelis, men, women, children, the elderly Holocaust survivors. Well, folks, we have a major development on that front today. Uh, now, Israel, obviously has been carrying out pinpoint targeted strikes against Iranian officials. And we'll talk about that today as well. Is war coming direct war between Israel and Iran and not just through proxy? Number two, striking high level Hezbollah officials. Number three, high level Hamas officials, Palestinian Islamic Jihad officials, commanders. Israel since October 7th has really unleashed a firestorm on these various jihadi terror leaders in the Iranian axis, in that Iranian ring of fire. Well, today, just a little while ago, we learned that the IDF eliminated three sons of a top Hamas terror leader. I'm going to tell you who he is, who they are, and what exactly happened in a minute. Before I do, quick reminder, if you're just joining us, to, to subscribe to the Watchman News channel right here on YouTube and click the notification bell so you get alerts every time a new video is posted. And I mentioned Stackelbeck tonight, my brand new nightly show on TBN. Now, we just launched two weeks ago. Things are going very well. If you like this kind of content that we bring to you on a daily basis on The Watchman here on YouTube, tune in to Stackelbeck tonight every weeknight, Monday through Friday on TBN at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Then with a re-air at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you missed the earlier show, you can catch it at 10.30 Eastern nationwide every night on TBN, Monday through Friday. Some great, great programming lined up, including tonight, an in-depth look at the gathering storm against America, Iran, China, North Korea, and uh, Russia. And that is tonight. And folks, it is in-depth and impactful. And the kind of information you're really not hearing anywhere else. So check out Stackelbeck tonight. In the meantime, I mentioned Israel, Gaza. That Hamas leader is Ismail Hanea. Now, you, he's certainly in the top vanguard of Hamas. He lives in Qatar right now. Surprise, surprise. He's also a billionaire. How did that money come to him? How did Ismail Hanea become so rich? Well, could it have something to do with him pocketing the billions of dollars in international aid, including from U.S. taxpayers that have flowed into Gaza over the years? And rather than feeding and helping the people of Gaza, he and his fellow Hamas chieftains pocketed the money and they lived lavish lifestyles in Qatar. Yes, that is the case. But three of Ismail Hanea's sons were eliminated by the Israel Defense Forces today. And folks, these weren't just any sons to Ismail Hanea. Here's some of the details from the Times of Israel. Breaking news here, very important. Israel says all three sons were operatives in Hamas. Now, they were killed along with four of Hanea's grandchildren in this attack, according to Hamas. So Hamas is saying there, there's no, in this case at least, there's no double speak. Hamas is saying, yes, this did indeed happen. Israel eliminated the sons of Ismail Hanea. And Ismail Hanea himself released a statement hailing his sons as martyrs and saying it was all worth it that their blood is not greater than the blood of the Palestinian people. The typical rhetoric, it's interesting here, before we get into the details of what these sons were doing and why Israel felt it necessary to target them, it's interesting to me, and it's a sad fact, that Ismail Hanea has sent how many countless thousands, at least, of young Palestinian men and women 
to their deaths over the past two, three decades, to their, quote, martyrdom, suicide bombers and all the rest, and now three of his sons. Now Ismail Hanea, after he sacrificed the sons and daughters of his fellow Palestinians for years, now he is paying a personal price, and his own sons were killed. And I'm sure that wasn't his intention, but when you live a life of terror and jihad, some very horrible things will happen to you and to your family after you butcher and maim and order the killing and order suicide bombings for decades. Eventually, there are consequences for that. And the three sons, according to the Times of Israel, Hazem, Amir, and Mohammed, were killed after the car they were driving in was struck in Gaza City's Shati camp. Now, that's according to Hamas. The deaths were first reported by, surprise, surprise, Al Jazeera. How did Al Jazeera have the inside track? I wonder how. And then confirmed by Hanea himself and Hamas. The IDF and the Shin Bet, the Israeli Internal Security Service, later confirmed killing the three men, the sons of Ismail Hanea, top Hamas leader, saying they were operatives in the terror group, Hamas. According to the IDF and Shin Bet, Amir Hanea was a squad commander in the Hamas military wing. And by the way, I'm just reading this straight off my phone. I do not want to misquote. While Hazem and Mohammed Hanea were low-ranking operatives, but also in the Hamas military wing. The IDF said that the trio were, quote, on their way to carry out terror activity in the area of central Gaza when they were struck. Hanea said, Ismail Hanea, the father, said, he thanks God, Allah, his God, for bestowing upon him the honor of his son's martyrdom. And he vowed that Hamas, despite his son's deaths, will never surrender, and that such actions by Israel will not make Hamas change its goals and its demands in hostage release talks. Folks, get this. This tells you when someone's completely given over to demonic evil, like Ismail Hanea is, this is the kind of response when your sons are killed. And by the way, his sons, by the time they, uh, from the time they could walk, were steeped and raised in this, in terror and jihad and anti-Israel genocidal hatred, anti-Semitism. This is how it goes in Gaza. Certainly, if you're the offspring of a Hamas leader, so Ismail Hanea raised his kids in this. Is it any wonder that they veered right into terrorism themselves and met the inevitable consequences of engaging in such activity? It's horrible, folks. This is the endless cycle in Gaza where young kids, two, three, four years old, are pictured with holding guns and being held aloft by Hamas terrorists. The glorification of violence, martyrdom, anti-Semitism, genocidal anti-Israel hatred. Young kids there are steeped in this. They're raised in it. They're in, it's ingrained in them from the time they're small. So is it shocking to anyone that the Hamas leader's sons end up in terror and meet this demise? By the way, one case, which has really struck me, and I've seen the video going viral, him and Dr. Phil, their interview, uh, Mossab Youssef, the son of Hamas. He wrote that great book, The Son of Hamas. I interviewed him many years ago. I haven't seen him lately, but he's been making the rounds a bit. He was interviewed by Dr. Phil recently, not far from where I'm sitting in our TBN headquarters here in Dallas-Fort Worth. And he is someone who left Hamas behind. His father was one of the founding members of Hamas. So, folks, don't buy the lie that you are how you're raised. And they had no chance. They just had no chance. I believe God Almighty implants in all of us. Look, you can be raised a certain way, and these three were certainly raised a certain way, but God Almighty will convict you. You, you know at the root the difference between good and evil and right and wrong. But you can make a choice to pursue evil. You can be taught something and, and brainwashed, but your own conscience should, your own, just again, in knowing between right and wrong, that own conviction should stop you before you say, I don't know, storm into Israel on October 7th and burn a, a family alive and, and slaughter a baby in its crib. 
which is what happened on October 7th. So, yes, you can be raised a certain way, but you're not the way you were raised. Uh, there's a more eloquent way to put that, but you can chart your own path in life. Ismail Hanea's sons were given over to evil as well, it seems. Before today, I didn't know much about them. I know there are three operatives in Hamas's military wing. Hamas's military wing is a demonic death cult. So you would think the apple didn't fall, sadly, too far from the tree here with Ismail Hanea's sons. Nonetheless, now what? And that's always the question, right? When there is a big, I guess you would say, takeout here, and a big fish is taken out by the IDF, the question is, okay, now what? Meaning, does Hamas respond? Does Iran respond? Hezbollah? Already, it's very interesting to me, already Iran is responding, offering its condolences. And another interesting one, folks, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish tyrant, responding, and I'm going to get to this direct quote from him. I'm just scrolling down to find it. And here's how he, re he responded. And folks, here it is. Bear in mind, this is the leader of a NATO member nation, although under Erdogan's radical rule, I refer to Turkey as NINO, NATO in name only. That's the, the course he's taken Turkey on, which is a sad fact, because Turkey was a staunch ally of Israel and the United States. But here's where we stand today under the rule of Recep Erdogan. According to the Times of Israel, just reading this straight off my phone, Turkish President Recep Erdogan offered condolences in a phone call to Hamas leader Ismail Hanea after the death of his three sons in Gaza. Erdogan told Hanea, quote, Israel will definitely be held accountable before the law for the crimes against humanity that it committed. Wow. So, folks, if there was any doubt, and look, Erdogan has spent months calling Hamas terrorists, martyrs, and mujahideen, holy warriors. Is there any doubt where Turkey stands and the future of Israel-Turkey relations? As long as Recep Erdogan and his Justice and Development Party, the AKP for short, AKP as they say in Turkey, as long as they're in power, there will be no rapprochement, no uh, return to normalcy between Israel and Turkey. Not for lack of trying on Israel's part, but because their supposed partner for any rapprochement, Turkey, led by Erdogan, it's led by a rabid anti-Israel, anti-Semite, radical Islamist who marches to the drummer of the Muslim Brotherhood. His party, the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, is the Turkish branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood is devoted to Israel's destruction. Hamas is a self-identified Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. So no, don't expect any cheery and cordial renewing of any kind of serious ties between Israel or meaningful ties between Israel and Turkey in the long run. Erdogan was making nice with Israel before October 7th because Turkey's economy was in the shambles and inflation was at astronomical levels. That's all out the window now. It takes moments like these for Erdogan to reveal his true face, but you have it and you just heard it. Does Hamas react, folks? Look, uh, I don't know that Hamas is in position right now to react to the death of Ismail Hanea's sons. Uh, Hamas, I think it's 18 of the 24 Hamas battalions, perhaps more than 18, have been decimated by Israel. We're kind of at a, a, a strange kind of pause I guess you would say, in the Gaza war right now, in that Israel swiftly and stunningly conquered north and central Gaza and most of south Gaza, other than, of course, Rafa. You know the name. You've been hearing about it for weeks now. Israel over the weekend pulled out most of its troops uh, from southern Gaza. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says, look, not that doesn't mean anything, but he's saying, hey, we're still going into Rafa. I mean, we're still going there. And the question is, and he says he set a date. Israel set a date. The defense minister, Yoav Gallant, says there's not a date. The question is, okay, what is the plan here? And Israel obviously can't reveal their plan, and they sh nor should they. They have to have the element of surprise. But Joe Biden is demanding basically a plan. And Israel is saying, you know what, we're going to do what we need to do to defend our country. I say all that to say, 
Is Rafa looming or isn't it looming? BB has vowed we're going into Rafa. Now there's a pretty large troop pullout over the weekend out of Gaza. <clears throat> so where is this all heading, folks? I don't think anyone knows other than in the prime minister's cabinet, to be quite honest with you. So <laughs> we're watching that closely. But Rafa is pretty much the last bastion for Hamas. Remember, Israel also had to reenter Shifa Hospital the, this month and late last month and basically reconquer Shifa Hospital because hundreds, probably thousands of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists reconstituted themselves and reestablished a presence in Shifa. So Israel rooted that out once again. Is that the future model here? These kind of commando raids and kind of you're playing whack-a-mole in a sense, right? Another little Hamas cell pops up. They start to reconstitute themselves and the IDF moves in. Uh, maybe a week-long operation, pinpoint strikes, then they pull back out. But perhaps that's where this is going. I know Israel doesn't want a full-scale occupation of Gaza. Who would? But when it comes to Rafa, it's the big one, folks, and it's still looming. And it's the big one not only because that's Hamas's last stand, where Hamas's final battalions are. You may have hostages there. Remember, there's over 100 hostages still held in Hamas captivity. There may be Hamas leaders hiding out there in tunnels beneath Rafa. Yahya Sinwar, he's still out there someplace. For all those reasons, Rafa is huge. Secondly, it's huge because the world is howling, weeping, and gnashing its teeth at the thought of Israel finishing the job and going into Rafa. Basically, the world wants to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Israel's close to absolutely crushing Hamas decisively. Decisively meaning where Hamas can't mount another October 7th style attack against Israel, certainly ever again, but where Hamas could never pose any sort of meaningful threat to the state of Israel ever again. Israel is at the cusp of doing that, and yet the world is screaming and howling and demanding an immediate ceasefire. And that's what Joe Biden wants as well. Now, he said that in an interview uh, a few days ago that is just surfacing, but then the White House released a statement saying, no, well, not just an unconditional unilateral ceasefire. The hostages must be released too. But folks, make no mistake about it. If it was a unilateral ceasefire, this administration in D.C. would not shed a tear. A unilateral ceasefire, by the way, that would leave Hamas alive to fight another day and to plan more October 7th. So will Hamas have any kind of meaningful response to the deaths of Ismail Hanea's sons? I don't know that they have the capabilities right now. Unless perhaps, look, Hamas still has a rocket arsenal. It's been severely depleted, and those rocket launches now are few and far between. Does Hamas have the capacity to carry out some rocket strikes? I'm sure. It absolutely still has rockets in its arsenal. Could it be a massive barrage like we saw in the past? No way. I find that highly doubtful. Hezbollah in the north, obviously a different story, but that Hamas arsenal has been severely depleted. Okay, that's Hamas and what they can do. Let's move on to Iran and the potential of, and we're hearing more about this, folks, in recent days, the potential of a direct conflict, a direct confrontation between Israel and the Iranian regime. Uh, well, why do I say that? A few things here. Uh, number one, Iran right now is threatening. I want to pull up some direct quotes from you here. Pardon me as I look down at my phone as I talk. Iran right now uh, is threatening to strike Israel, and they're saying it's coming. They are promising revenge against Israel for the death of Mohammad Reza Zahedi. Now, this happened about nine days ago, and we reported it here in the newscast. And if you miss any of our newscasts, hey, be sure to just go to our homepage under newscasts, and they're all right there. And subscribe while you're there. We're almost, hard to believe, at 900,000 subscribers for such a time as this, by the grace of God, because we've got a message of truth, biblical truth, that we're getting out in these perilous times for the world, for Israel. I mean, for the state of Israel, there has been no more perilous time since 1948, right? Since the miraculous rebirth of the world's one and only Jewish state, which makes these Iranian threats so grave. Now, Zahedi, taken out last week, he and another top Iranian general, and, and additional members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Iran almost simultaneously was blaming Israel and vowing revenge. They were taken out in Damascus, by the way. Just to refresher for you, if you missed this, part of the Iranian consulate was taken out, taken out by the Israeli Air Force. 
they were inside these Iranian officials, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps officials. So Iran is breathing threats of revenge for Zahedi. Folks, I'm telling you every single day, uh, the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei is vowing revenge. We're going to do it. We're going to hit back. The chief of Iran's navy yesterday not only vowed revenge for Zahedi's death, he threatened to perhaps close the Strait of Hormuz, that strategic waterway, where much of the world's oil supply flows through on a daily basis. So you have that. And then you have other Iranian officials, Raisi, the Iranian president, vowing revenge. Ismail Ghana, the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, vowing revenge. And there's been all this speculation over the past few days in the mainstream media. Okay, they're saying Iran's going to respond. But how is Iran going to respond? And the big debate and the big conversation is, will Iran respond directly? Will Iran actually fire ballistic missiles from Iranian territory at Israel. Number two, will Iran act like it usually does through proxy, meaning Hezbollah, militias in Syria, Iraq, they'd be the most likely candidates since Hamas and Islamic Jihad are on the, in their death throes right now in many ways. Hezbollah and the Syrian Iraq-based militias and Yemen, the Houthis, of course, would seem to be the most likely avenues for Iranian retaliation. Number three, you always have the possibility, I'm sad to say, of Iran lashing out and striking Israeli embassies, consulates, synagogues, Jewish targets around the world. This is on the table right now. But some people think this was such a heavy blow to Iran, and it was, and an embarrassment and many other things for the Iranian regime, that Iran's going to have to directly strike Israel rather than through proxy. Now, my thought on that is, okay, they could do that. But Israel would take this as a moment of opportunity and say, now we can go all in and we can strike Iran and strike them hard for some backup to this. It's not a theory, but to this analysis, I guess you would say, let's rewind to May 2018. Uh, Iran launched a few rockets into Israel from the Golan and Israel responded with overwhelming force, striking Iranian military targets throughout Syria. The, the rockets were launched from Syria. If you have a barrage of rockets coming from Iran proper, I mean, you can multiply the Israeli response. And you know what? In that case, if Iran directly, nation to nation and not through proxy, if Iran directly strikes the state of Israel, Israel might say, this gives us a green light to not only strike targets in Iran, but to strike, you guessed it, folks, which targets? Iran's nuclear facilities. And Iran right now, has their nuclear program has largely flown under the radar since October 7th. The world's been focused, understandably, Gaza, Hezbollah, and Iran. In the meantime, the centrifuges are spinning. And the nuclear weapons are being developed. So Israel could see that as their opportunity to strike those nuclear facilities and eliminate an existential threat. Here's a little bit more on that. And what Israel is saying, I'm gonna read you some quotes from Yoav Gallant, the Israeli defense minister, that's what I was pulling up here, and the foreign minister, Israel Katz. Now on Wednesday, both of them threatened that if Iran launches an attack from Iranian soil, then Israel would strike back inside Iran. And folks, not just covert type things inside Iran, cyber attacks, espionage like we've seen, targeted assassinations. We've seen all that on Iranian soil. Israel clearly has great intelligence and assets inside Iran. This would be something more. I mean, Iran striking back perhaps against Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps sites inside Iran, the nuclear facilities, of course, on the table. Now, what will Iran do? There's been some speculation that Iran will not strike Israeli civilian targets because they then they know that Israel would unleash hell in return, but they'll try to target military sites, some kind of other sensitive installations inside Israel, but not civilian installations, not civilian targets. Do they do it through proxy? Do they do it directly? I, I think one option that we don't know, folks. I think anyone who tells you they do is probably lying. So we don't know. But I think one option that is probably not on the table for Iran is do nothing at all. 
Iran has to save face here in their view. So they're likely going to do something. I don't know a date. It could be. I heard some rumblings from some friends in Israel uh, the other day who I spoke to who said it may take a few weeks for Iran to devise this response. I've heard from others it's going to be at the end the, the end of Ramadan. I, I've heard from others it was supposed to happen last weekend over a 48-hour span. It hasn't happened yet, but you can rest assured that in the Iranian war room, they're having these conversations right now. So they're going to try something. Uh, and it may not be, again, against Israel proper. It may be against an Israeli target around the world. Iranian officials are saying that all no Israeli embassy is safe, is what they've been saying. So my response to that, number one, is I can tell you Israel is prepared for any contingency, and they're prepared to respond in a very appropriate and forceful manner. Uh, I can tell you, number two, that the IDF, from being on live fire drills with the IDF, They've been training and training and training for years, especially for that coming great northern war in Lebanon and Syria. And I can tell you, number three, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm going to pray for Israel writ large. And it's not a large country. It's the size of the state of New Jersey. Prayer works. And I'm going to continue to pray God's hedge of protection over the people of Israel, that, that he surrounds Israel with his angels. The God of Israel, the Bible is very clear, neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Bible is also very clear that it's not going to be easy for Israel. Israel is going to reach its ultimate destiny, biblically. God has his hand on the nation, but it ain't going to be easy. And there's going to be a lot of down points, no doubt, and peaks and valleys. And right now we're in a valley in many ways. It's not going to be hard as we approach the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what the Bible calls it. But folks, I'm going to stay in prayer for this. We're biblically mandated as followers of Jesus to do just that. So I'm going to do it. But there is, it seems, a collision course right now between Israel and Iran. What do you think as you're watching right now? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? What, how would Iran react? And we're all playing kind of armchair intel, I guess, right now. Only certain folks really know how this is going to go. But it's a tinderbox. And what has struck me is the West, Europe, condemning the European Union, we reported this last week on the newscast, condemning Israel's elimination of Zahedi, who, by the way, was arguably the most important Islamic Revolutionary Guards official in the entire Middle East, in charge of operations in Syria, uh, in Lebanon, a uh, main conduit between Hezbollah and helping to direct Hezbollah activities. I mean, Israel saved countless Israeli lives by preemptively eliminating him. He wasn't in Damascus uh, for an Easter egg hunt last weekend. Let's just put it that way. He was in Damascus for high-level terror meetings with other terror officials, plotting terror towards Israel. So Israel did what any sovereign nation would do, I believe. And, and before that threat was allowed to metastasize and claim Israeli lives, they took action first. It's not the first time Israel's done that. 1967, many, many other times targeted assassinations of terror leaders. And Israel knew that a response would come, and they knew that such a heavy blow to Iran would not go unanswered. And now Israel's saying, okay. And why would Israel do that? And the Biden administration certainly is gnashing its teeth about it as well. Oh my gosh, Israel, you just escalated tensions. Well, I think it kind of started that whole escalation of tensions on October 7th, maybe? When Iranian-backed and Iranian-trained Hamas terrorists stormed into Israel and carried out the worst massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust, was that an escalation of tensions? So Israel preemptively eliminating a terrorist with loads of Israeli blood, and by the way, American blood on his hands. I'm sure Zahedi over the years was directing attacks against U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria for that matter, but I digress. It's escalating tensions to essentially protect your country from harm, to kill a man who has killed and would kill many more and plan to kill many more Israelis. That's the escalation of tensions? Wasn't the escalation of tensions the invasion? I mean, a literal invasion of Israel on October 7th? Was it an escalation of tensions on October 8th when Hezbollah, not Israel, began firing barrages of rockets into Israel? Did Hamas and Hezbollah 
escalate things on October 7th and October 8th? Did Iran escalate things when it trained 500 Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives on Iranian soil in the run-up in the weeks leading up to October 7th? Did Iran escalate things in October, November when it activated the Houthis in the Red Sea and Yemen in a major way and began attacking shipping practically every day? Was that an escalation? Why aren't we hearing about those escalations? But when Israel strikes a terrorist with Israeli blood on his hands who wanted more on his hands, that's a that's an unacceptable, dangerous, and reckless escalation. As was, by the way, let's see, moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem in May 2018. That was going to create the war to end all wars in the Middle East. So there's a track record here from the usual suspects on the left, in the Washington, D.C. establishment, and in the mainstream media, in the State Department, the CIA, etc. And it never seems to hold terrorist accountables accountable. It's always Israel. How dare you do this? How could you do this? It's very reckless of you. So folks, look, Tinderbox will continue to come here with updates. Before I go, we're talking about the people of Israel. Passover is right around the corner, April 22nd, less than two weeks away. Now, this is the most difficult Passover for the Jewish people, people of Israel. Well, you could say in one regard, 2020, right? Where that was a Passover like no other since probably the first Passover in many ways, where the streets were empty and, and people were inside their, shut inside their homes during the COVID madness. But this Passover is heavy, 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 needless to say, for the people of Israel. It's a time of war. It's in the aftermath of October 7th. One war in the midst of it right now in Gaza. Other wars looming. Hezbollah for sure. Are we going to see a larger war with Iran unfold? And perhaps before April 22nd when Passover commences. This is again the most difficult time for the state of Israel since its miraculous modern rebirth in 1948. So a heaviness, heavy hearts at this Passover, and especially for Israel's most vulnerable. That's where Mayor Panim comes in. My good friends at Mayor Panim, hey, folks, you know that you watch a newscast on a regular basis. I'm not out here promoting a bunch of organizations every day. There's a lot of organizations I love, but there's only some I'll partner with when I truly believe in what they're doing. Mayor Panim is one of them. Visit mpgive.org. That's mpgive.org. Mayor Panim, look, as Hamas is doing what it's doing, as it's done what it's done on October 7th, Mayor Panim is there. It's a humanitarian organization based in Israel and here in the United States. They have offices as well, but several offices in Israel Number one, I've been there with Mayor Panim on the ground serving hot meals to Holocaust survivors. And they are really doing God's work in helping underprivileged families, Holocaust survivors. But right now, folks, families affected by the war, families in southern Israel. And by the way, of course, along the Gaza border, which was struck on October 7th and evacuated. And by the way, northern Israel, where some 80,000, if not more, Israelis have also been evacuated as the Hezbollah threat looms. Mayor Panim stepping in, providing hot meals, food, shelter, clothes, humanitarian assistance, prayer for these neediest of Israelis. A lot of people say, well, man, I want to help. I want to help Israel. I can't get to Israel right now because of the war and everything, but I want to help Israel. I can't think of a better way to do that, folks, than to partner with Mayor Panim. Again, it is mpgive.org. That's mpgive.org. Check it out. A great, great organization doing God's work for such a time as this. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here today on the Watchman Newscast. Until tomorrow, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.